morning, Blooming Grove friends and family, and thank you for joining me online. As I'm sure all of you are well aware by now, we've spent the last several weeks taking a fresh look at some of the miracles of Jesus. In the Gospels, we have eyewitness accounts of myriad miracles that occurred at the hands of Jesus. And these miracles are not just incredible displays of divine power and authority, but they're also windows into the mission and mind of Jesus. They help us to understand who Jesus is and who we are in relationship to him. Over the last few weeks, we've seen Jesus miraculously turn water into wine and heal a, a paralyzed man's legs. He miraculously stilled the storm on Lake Galilee and multiplied five loaves and two fish in order to, to feed 5,000 hungry families. Last Sunday, Jesus encountered a demon-possessed man marked by misery and miraculously cast the demons out, giving the man a new mission and purpose in life. And in so doing, Jesus demonstrated that his power and authority extends beyond the physical world into the spiritual realm as well. And as we continue our journey through the miracles of Jesus this morning, I want to explore one of the most stunning and spectacular miracles of all. If you, you'd like to follow along in your Bible, uh, open up to Matthew chapter 14. That's where the story is told. One afternoon, Peter, James, John, and the rest of the disciples all climbed into their small boat once again and set sail across Lake Galilee. Uh, being professional fishermen, if there was one thing they knew, it was how to handle a boat. But even these experienced seamen weren't prepared for the storm that set in that night. The Bible says in Matthew 14, verse 24, The disciples were in trouble far away from land, for a strong wind had risen, and they were fighting heavy waves. As night fell, the wind and the waves rose. Their little fishing boat was being tossed and spun in the storm. And this story probably feels somewhat familiar to you because it starts off much like the miracle of Jesus stilling the storm on Lake Galilee. Uh, it may have even felt eerily familiar to the disciples themselves. However, there's one important difference. This time, Jesus wasn't on the boat. Earlier that evening, Jesus told his disciples that he wanted to spend a little time alone in prayer. So he sent the disciples ahead of them, promising to catch up with them, meet them on the other side of the lake. So Peter and the others found themselves alone in the storm in the dead of night without a miracle worker on board. But then something unbelievable happened. The Bible says in verse 25, about three o'clock in the morning, Jesus came toward them walking on the water. This is one of the most incredible and iconic miracles of Jesus. John tells us that the boat was already three or four miles uh, away from the shore. And so this isn't just the case of like they see Jesus walking along the shore and it looks like he's walking on water or, or maybe he's walking through shallow water or something like that. No, this was Jesus literally defying gravity, walking across the surface of Lake Galilee as if it were solid stone. The Old Testament often describes God's control over the seas. And so Jesus walking on the water was uh, an unmistakable indication of his divinity. In fact, uh, Job declares, speaking of God in Job chapter 9, verse 8 and 10, 8 through 10, he alone stretches out the heavens and treads on the waves of the sea. He performs wonders that cannot be fathomed, miracles that cannot be counted. Although Job, I'm sure, had in mind God the Father when he spoke these words, 
They are a perfect, prophetic, powerful description of this very moment in the life of Jesus. Jesus literally treads on the waves of the sea, performing wonders that cannot be fathomed. Of course, with their vision obscured by the darkness and the rain, none of the disciples recognized Jesus as he approached the boat. Rather, they simply spotted this, this shadowy figure moving toward them. And as it drew closer, it became apparent that it was the, the figure of a human being walking or gliding across the water. I mean, let that image sink in for a moment and then try to put yourselves in the soaking wet sandals of the disciples. It, this scene sounds like something out of a horror movie. You know, this, this shadowy dark figure moving across the misty sea. And that's exactly how it felt to the disciples. The Bible says in verse 26, they were terrified. In their fear, they cried out, it's a ghost. They've been battling the buffeting waves for hours. And then, like an omen of their impending doom, they see what appears to be an apparition or a specter floating toward them over and through the rising mist of the sea. They thought they were done for. This was death coming for them. But that's when Jesus calls out to them in verse 27, Have courage! It is I. Do not be afraid. Twelve disciples sat in that boat. And we don't know how the other eleven reacted to Jesus' voice. Maybe with confusion or wonder or disbelief or a mixture of all of that. But one of them, Peter, was about to do the unimaginable. He recognized the power of God within Jesus and realized that this was an extraordinary opportunity for spiritual growth and adventure. And so Peter, he was within eyesight and earshot of Jesus from the boat, but that wasn't close enough. When fear and danger was all around, Peter wanted to be where Jesus was. And so he got an idea. He decided to do something ridiculous. He decided to get out of the boat and join Jesus on the water. Now, we've seen Jesus do some mind-blowing miracles. But what makes this miracle so unique is that for the first time, an ordinary human being joined Jesus in doing the impossible. Through faith in Jesus, Peter participated in this miracle. Peter became the, the first and only ordinary human being to defy gravity and walk on the water just like Jesus. How did he do it? What does it take to walk on water? Well, I don't believe that any of us, you or I, will ever literally walk on water the way that Peter does here. We all experience moments in life where we must choose between giving in to fear or stepping out on faith. How do you and I step out in faith to experience God's miraculous power and presence the way that Peter did? What can we learn from Peter about experiencing the miracles of Jesus firsthand? Well, as we work our way through this miracle story, let me draw out three potential answers to those questions. If you want to walk on water, the first thing that you have to do is listen to Jesus' call. Listen to Jesus. When Peter heard the voice of Jesus, he blurts out in verse 28, Lord, if it's really you, then command me to come to you on the water. I can only imagine the smile that must have stretched across Jesus' face when he heard Peter, and he replies to him, Come. Now, why do you suppose Matthew includes this little exchange in the story? I mean, if Peter really thought that he could walk on water like Jesus, why doesn't he just jump into the water and, and take off running? Well, I think 
I think it's like this for, for an important reason. You see, this isn't just a story about risk-taking. It's primarily a story about obedience. This isn't a story about you know, extreme sports. It's about extreme discipleship. Before Peter got out of the boat, he had to be sure that Jesus actually wanted him to get out of the boat. And so he asked for clarification and then listened to Jesus' command. For you and me, that means we, we must carefully discern between an authentic call from God and what might simply be a foolish impulse on our part. There's a fine line between courage and stupidity. Discernment is the difference. If you and I want to walk on water, if we want to do the seemingly impossible, then we need to brush up on our listening skills. Now, I don't believe that God ordinarily speaks in audible ways to us today. In fact, he really didn't do that all that often in biblical times either. I mean, he usually only spoke audibly to certain select individuals like Moses and Abraham or, or the prophets, things like that. But God does speak. I mean, Jesus said in John 10 verse 27, my sheep listen to my voice. My sheep listen to my voice. Jesus speaks to us today in a variety of different ways. The question is, are we listening for his voice? You know, sometimes God may speak to us through a restless spirit. Other times God uses another person's words to speak to us, a poignant sermon that just happens to speak to our immediate needs, or, or maybe a surprisingly relevant book that a, a friend recommends on social media. You know, sometimes God speaks to us through unusual blessings you know, as he tries to get our attention, or other times he may use disappointments and difficulties and failures for that very same reason. God may even impress a specific message into our hearts through his Spirit, what Bill Hybels calls the whispers of the Holy Spirit. In each and every one of these and other similar circumstances, we ought to turn to God and ask, God, are you speaking to me? I'm listening. Or as Peter said, if it's really you, command me. And of course, the, the most important way and primary way that God speaks to us today is through the Bible. The opening words of the book of Hebrews assures us, Hebrews 1 verse 1 and 2, Long ago, God spoke in many different ways to our fathers, through the prophets, in visions, dreams, and even face to face, telling them little by little about his plans. But now, in these days, he has spoken to us through his Son. The little red letters splashed across the pages of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are Jesus' words to the world, but they're also his words to you. Every time you read scripture, you can be sure that God is speaking to you. And he just might be calling you to action. Maybe God is calling you into a, a particular ministry. Perhaps he's calling you into a certain career or to help a, a particular person with a, a, whatever dilemma they're facing. Maybe he's calling you to share your faith with a certain friend or neighbor. Or maybe God is, is calling you to into a deeper, more meaningful relationship with Jesus. In any case, we ought to do what Peter did. Peter listened to Jesus' voice and obeyed his call. And as a result, Peter became the first and only ordinary human being to walk on water. Jesus wants each of us to respond to him the same way Peter did. And he issues a similar invitation. He wants all of us to come to him, to draw close to him, and to experience his power and his presence in a personal way. But we have to listen and respond to his command. Now, Secondly, if you want to walk on water, joining Jesus in the miraculous, you've got to look beyond the wind and the waves and fix your eyes on Jesus. Look to Jesus. 
Peter was so full of faith and obedience when he launched out of the boat onto the sea. I don't know how many steps he was able to take, but I can imagine the emotion and exhilaration with each one. Somewhere between his ship and his Savior, though, Peter took his eyes off of Jesus. And the Bible says in verse 30, But when Peter saw the wind and the waves, he became afraid and began to sink. Jesus seems somewhat disappointed in Peter. And and most preachers tend to criticize Peter as if this were just some thoughtless, foolish impulse. But really, I mean, would you or I have done any better? At the command of Jesus, Peter was defying gravity literally walking on water, whether he took two steps or ten steps, it's more than I've ever done. But this wasn't a calm, still sea. Rather, they were still in the midst of this this raging storm that had the disciples afraid when they were in the boat. Peter must have he must have looked something like Wiley e. Coyote, you know, chasing after the run, road runner right off the edge of a cliff. You know, he, he's fine, he's just running on air until he looks down and realizes there's no ground beneath his feet, and then he, he plummets to the valley below him. Peter, you know, as long as he looked to Jesus, as long as his eyes were locked on Jesus, he was fine. But then he looked away and he saw the wind and the waves, and his heart was filled with fear. Fear. If there's one great enemy of faith, it's fear. We fear being sued, finishing last, going broke, the mole on the back, the sound of the clock as it ticks us ever closer to the grave. Every season brings fresh reasons for fear, and it feels dreadful. Fear sucks the life out of the soul, and and it drains us dry of contentment. You know, they say the most common fear among people is a fear of public speaking, uh, which is just slightly higher than the fear of death. Uh, So I suppose if you're at a funeral, you'd rather be the guy in the casket than the one giving the eulogy. But what if faith, not fear, was our default reaction to threats? Before Peter even set foot on the water, Jesus shouted to him in verse 27, Do not be afraid. Have courage, he said. I think that's because fear is the number one reason people refuse to get out of the boat. And it's the number one reason why they fail if they do. Fear says no. Faith says go. Life is is much more frightening when we take our eyes off Jesus and view the the circumstances around us as if they're just wind and waves, uncontrolled, meaningless chaos, rather than the planned, purposeful puzzle pieces that they really are. If we fixate on the problems at hand, our immediate circumstances, and dwell on the struggles and sorrows of this world, like Peter, we'll begin to sink will begin to doubt and will be swallowed up by waves of fear. But, as it says in Hebrews 12, verse 2, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, will give us sure footing. If you want to join in the miracles of Jesus, if you want to do the impossible, you have to listen to Jesus. You have to look to Jesus. And finally, you have to lean on Jesus. Lean on Jesus. The Bible says that Peter, when he began to sink, he cried out to Jesus. In verse 30 and 31, he shouted, Lord, save me! And immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught Peter. My goodness, what a beautiful moment. Peter may have stumbled, but he knew where to turn for help. Jesus reached out his hand, and he caught Peter, and he pulled him back up out of the angry waves. And then, arm in arm, they returned to the boat, walking on the water once again, this time 
together. If you're willing to get out of the proverbial boat, to, to step out of your comfort zone, there will be times when you fail, times when you fall. In fact, failure is a part of life. You know, Michael Jordan knows a little something about that. Jordan and his Chicago Bulls team are remembered for their six NBA championships and, and record-breaking seasons. But many people forget about the struggles they had climbing to the top of the NBA. Prior to winning their first championship in 1990, they lost badly in the final round of the Eastern Conference Finals two years in a row to the Detroit Pistons. And reflecting on those first two failed attempts to get to the NBA Finals, Michael Jordan once said, Failure always made me try harder the next time. I failed over and over in my career, and that is why I succeed. And the truth is, failure really is a part of success. It's how we learn. It's how we grow. If you let it, it will heighten your resolve. If Peter hadn't fallen, he never would have known the joys of being rescued by Jesus. Life is full of stumbles and fumbles, fraught with opportunities to, to make mistakes, occasions to feel guilty, and, and the drive to do it yourself. You know, there's a lot of pressure in our world to be self-sufficient, but that isn't the life that Jesus calls us to. He wants us to lean on him. Maybe you failed in school or in your career. Maybe you failed at relationships or your Christian walk. Maybe you failed more times than you can count and you feel the weight of those failures every day. Don't give up. Don't surrender to the sea. Don't let your failures define you or destroy you. Instead, cry out to Jesus like Peter did. He will catch you. Let him lift you out of the angry waves. Lean on Jesus and together you will walk again. I've always loved the, the hymn written by E.A. Hoffman, Leaning on Jesus. He writes, What have I to dread? What have I to fear? Leaning on the everlasting arms. I have blessed peace with my Lord so near. Leaning on the everlasting arms. Leaning on Jesus leaning on Jesus, safe and secure from all alarms, leaning on Jesus, leaning on Jesus, leaning on the everlasting arms. As I said, this particular miracle is unlike any other recorded in Scripture because Jesus not only performs this jaw-dropping miracle himself, but he invites an average, ordinary Joe like Peter to join him by listening to Jesus' call, looking to Jesus despite the storm, and leaning on Jesus after experiencing failure, Peter was able to do the impossible, to participate in an astonishing miracle of Jesus. And so can you. If you want to do with God's help what you never thought you could do, if you want to be where Jesus is, to draw closer to him and to experience his power and presence in unimaginable ways. In other words, if you want to walk on water, then there are three things you absolutely must do. Listen to Jesus, look to Jesus, and lean on Jesus. There's no telling. If you will do those three things, there is no telling what miracle Jesus might do for and through you. Next week is Easter Sunday, and we'll be taking a fresh look at the most meaningful miracle of all, the resurrection of Christ. I hope you'll join me then. For now, if you're in need of a miracle right now, or you're just looking for some adventure in your life, I want to encourage you to follow in Peter's watery footsteps. And if there's anything that, that I can do for you or the, or the church can pray for you, please reach out to me and let me know. In the meantime, let's pray together. Lord Jesus, we can understand the apostles' fears when they were stuck out on that ship in the midst of the storm. 
We can even understand their fears when they saw you approaching. Many of us wrestle with fears of our own Lord, but I pray that you might fill us with courage and faith. May we listen for your voice and obey your call. May we keep our eyes on you and lean on you when we fall. We pray in your magnificent name. Amen. Thank you once again for joining me. I hope you have a blessed week, and I'll see you next Sunday. Thank you.